Coffee arrived in Europe in 1529, and most historians date modern European history from the 1500s. Is that a coincidence? As I record this, I have close to hand my second cup of coffee of the day. The uh, stimulating effects of the caffeine, I hope, will keep me going until late afternoon, and then I will likely indulge myself in another. But go back to the uh, bad old days. Historians in the West, we use uh, B.C. and A.D. to mark a major break in Western history. B.C., of course, stands for before coffee. So let's go before coffee to the B.C. era when most popular drinks, the most popular of them, were actually alcoholic. Even at breakfast, the uh, most common drinks were weak beer and sometimes wine in varying degrees. Historian Tom Standage points out that water supplies near most human settlements were suspect, so drinking alcohol was often healthier than drinking water. But the high rates of alcohol consumption also had side effects, the obvious ones. It meant that most people spent much of their waking hours under the influence, so to speak. They were mellowed or inebriated to varying degrees. But along came coffee, and everything changed. And now we're going to the pro-coffee cause the enlightenment argument. Morning coffee drinkers, they begin their days energized. Their senses and their intellects are stimulated. And as a result, in the 1500s, Europeans started to work harder, and they started to work smarter. And then the rest is history. Deep-thinking science and clever engineering took off. Poets and playwrights became more creative. Even the average man and woman became more productive each day, all thanks to coffee. Also socially important was the development of European coffee house culture. Right? The coffee houses brought people together of all stripes, classes, interests, and talents for drinking and socializing. So we can imagine how kind of unac Countably, many business deals or philosophical debates or artistic inspirations and travel the world expeditions were launched over a cup of coffee. For uh, travelers, the uh, Braun Company site has some pictures of some famous European coffee house cultures, some of them that date back to the 1600s to, uh, to add to your, your travel bucket list. I'll put the link in the transcription. So we have an interesting question here. How can far, uh, rather, how far can we take this coffee caused the enlightenment thesis? To answer that question, we must turn to the Turks, because it's actually thanks to the militaristic and the imperial ambitions of the Turks that coffee came to Europe. Under Suleiman the Magnificent, the uh, Ottoman Empire was expanding westward into Europe until it was halted at Vienna in 1529. Little sidebar, I have a suspicion that His Magnificence Suleiman was so named for his truly magnificent headgear, as many online images will attest. However, headgear aside, the Turkish army was re repulsed at Vienna, and when they retreated in rather a hurry, they left behind many bags containing coffee beans. Enter the next hero of our story, Franz Georg Kolschitsky, a Pole who had actually lived in Turkey for some time, uh, but uh, now it distinguished himself in the fight against Suleiman's forces. Kolschitsky recognized the coffee beans that had been left behind by the retreating Ottoman forces. He claimed them as war booty. And then uh, after the war, he launched himself as an entrepreneur in Vienna by opening its very first coffee house. The brew he came up with sometimes was mixed with sugar, sometimes mixed with milk or both. It was very popular with the Viennese and coffee and coffee houses then spread rapidly across Europe. So let us salute both Suleiman of the Magnificent Headwear and Herr Kolschitsky of the Entrepreneurial Alertness. Unintentionally in Suleiman's case and intentionally in Kolschitsky's case, those of us who worship at the altar of the bean know to whom we should direct our reverent thanks. But that history as background, Exactly how much of the benefits of modern civilization and the achievements of the Enlightenment flowed from the introduction of coffee? 
There certainly is a time overlap, coffee arriving in the 1500s, the Enlightenment flowering by the time we get to the late 1600s and on into the 1700s. Well, I'm skeptical, because in part we should note that the Turks had both coffee and a coffee house culture for at least a century before the Europeans did. But it wasn't the Turks that went on to develop the powerful ideas and institutions that shaped modern civilization and culminated in the Enlightenment of the 1700s. So coffee cannot be the only factor at work here. Of course, we can rejoin that about the same time that the Europeans were developing their coffee culture, especially on into the 1600s, in the Ottoman Empire, centering in Istanbul, the public consumption of coffee was banned for a host of religious and claimed public health reasons. So maybe it's bad politics that overrode the widespreadness of coffee that are by short-circuiting developments that might have led to modernization and enlightenment happening in the Ottoman Empire. Even so, I'm still skeptical because it's worth noting that the following major Western civilization historical events, all of these hugely shaping modernity, all of them that predated the arrival of coffee in 1529. So consider, for example, that the energetic Portuguese, they'd already been sailing up and down West African coasts for a century. Bartholomew Dias led an expedition around the Cape of Good Hope in 1487. That's uh, 42 years before coffee arrives in Europe. Vasco da Gama reached India by 1498. Pedro Alvarez Cabral got to Brazil in 1500. Working with the Spanish, the Italian Christopher Columbus crossed the Atlantic in 1492. And the Portuguese, Ferdinand Magellan, led the first voyage around the world in 1519. So, no coffee, but lots of energetic world exploration that's pregnant for the future already happening. Another uh, important world historical event in Germany, Martin Luther posted his 98 thesis on the Wittenberg church door in 1517. That's 12 years before coffee's arrival in Vienna. And the 1517 posting by Martin Luther triggers the great unleashing of religious energy in the Reformation and counter-Reformation battles. Luther himself was a major consumer of beer and alcohol, but no coffee ever crossed his lips. This quotation, perhaps it's uh, tongue-in-cheek from Luther, but it's uh, ascribed to him, quote, Whoever drinks beer, he is quick to sleep. Whoever sleeps long does not sin. Whoever does not sin enters heaven. Thus, let us drink beer, unquote. Coffee, we might infer, then being a stimulant, uh, is likely to be a contributor to sinful living. But the point here for history is that the great upheaval in European religious life was accompanied with large quantities of beer and wine, but no coffee. Sometime uh, before 1514, the Pole Nicholas Copernicus first sketched his heliocentric model of the universe. And astronomers and mathematicians were already busy making very careful observations and calculations of the movements of the planets and the stars, again, before coffee. So by the time that coffee did arrive in Europe, revolutions in world exploration, religion, and science were already underway across the continent. We should also uh, point out that the you know, going way back in history, classical Greeks and the Romans and others earlier built pretty great civilizations with no coffee at all, hard as that might be to imagine. So my view is that coffee, therefore, can at most get contributory credit for helping create modern civilization. A plug for tea also, you know, the Dutch brought tea to Europe in 1610. It's about 80 years after coffee's arrival. They're adding another stimulant to the menu, but coffee's and tea's physiological effects at most added force to trends that were already activated. World exploration and early globalization, religious civil war and reformation, the development of the modern sciences, technological innovations, the push for universal literacy, and more. All of that was going on in Europe without 
coffee. So in all of those cases, I think the physiologically or physically energizing effects of caffeine were enhancements to civilization's development because feeling energetic does not all by itself determine how you're going to direct all of the energy that you have. And that depends on a person's beliefs and that person's values. An energetic person can devote himself to war, to the pursuit of sexual pleasure, to religious asceticism, to trying to discover magic formulas in ancient texts, or any number of pursuits. Many of those pursuits, or some of them, are not going to go anywhere. Some of them might lead to the development of modernity. So if we want a fuller explanation, even a more important uh, explanation of the development of modern civilization, what we need to ask is, what are the new ideas and the values that the Europeans are adopting and toying with that set them off on a different path? A physical stimulant alone won't explain much. Now, that's coffee in particular, but it does take us to the more general, interesting philosophical question about making major historical cause and effect claims, what uh, sometimes more casually called what if history. Right? What is the status of what if history? The uh, coffee caused the Enlightenment is closely related to this bundle of interesting questions. Now, I'm reminded here of a very audacious claim about historical causation that was made by the philosopher John Stuart Mill. In 1846, he published a review of Grote's History of Greece, a book Mill was greatly impressed with. But in his review, Mill makes this claim. This is the audacious claim. Quote, The Battle of Marathon, even as an event in British history, is more important than the Battle of Hastings, unquote. Now, when I read that, my first reaction to Mill's sentence was agreement. My second reaction, though, was to the audacity of the claim and to then wonder how on earth it could be justified. So what we're looking at is a battle that occurred in 1066, the, the Battle of Hastings between the Norman French and the English. That was 780 years before Mill. And so what we have is one set of claims that are saying contemporary British circumstances largely owe their making and shaping to an event that occurred 780 years before. But Mill is also then saying the 490 BC Battle of Marathon right, between the Greeks and the Persians, that is to say, an event that took place 2,336 years before Mill was even more important historically. But how does one make cause and effect claims about human actions involving millions of people across thousands of years? How do you compare two events that are themselves separated almost by 2,000 years in terms of one's being more important and the other being less important? That takes some major conceptualizing cojones. Now, here's uh, John Stuart Mill's sentence in full context. We can start, of course, by saying, you know, Greek history and Greek accomplishments absolutely important to who we are and our understanding of ourselves in the modern world. So here's the quote. The interest of Greek history is unexhausted and inexhaustible. As a mere story, hardly any other portion of authentic history can compete with it. Its characters, its situations, the very march of its incidents are epic. It is an heroic poem of which the personages are peoples. It is also, of all histories of which we know so much, the most abounding in consequences to us who now live. The true ancestors of the European nations, it has been well said, are not those from whose blood they are sprung, but those from whom they derive the richest portion of their inheritance. The Battle of Marathon, as an event in English history, is more important than the Battle of Hastings. If the issue of that day had been different, the Britons and the Saxons might still have been wandering in the woods." Unquote. So Mill's doing some what-if history, right, or uh, counterfactual history. We know we are what we are today significantly because of the Greek victory at Marathon to over 2,300 years ago. But 
where would we be if the Persians had won on that day? Now, there are two separate propositions that are being asserted here, so let's uh, separate the two. Here's the first one, or the first pairing. The Greeks defeated the Persians at Marathon. Therefore, we are where we are today. Now, what positive evidence do we have connecting those two sentences? What connects the Greek defeat of the Persians at Marathon to where we are today? The second is the what if proposition. If the Persians had defeated the Greeks at Marathon, then dot, dot, dot. And here's my question. How do we complete that sentence? So let's explore both of them further. All right, the first one, the Greeks defeated the Persians at Marathon, therefore we are where we are today. So we could say something like the following, the Greeks defeating the Persians, that made it possible for Greek culture to be transmitted across the generations. We're not saying that, that it was a deterministic process, you know, each generation's decisions makers, to varying degrees, they have to accept and propagate its distinctive Greek inheritance of you know, independent, naturalistic thinking. But to the extent that each generation did that, it developed a culture of rationality, creativity, innovation, science, artistry, and so on. Now, as historians, we can see the positive evidence for those connections as they played out across time. We can see the Western European decision makers, by contrast of the 300 to 1,000 time period, we can see them largely rejecting the Greek philosophy and declining into the Dark Ages. But further east, we can see the evidence that Byzantium continued to flourish, keeping alive the Greek texts and the Greek ideas. Then we can see in the 1100s to the 1400s, the decision makers rediscovering and rejuvenating the Greek ideals and the Renaissance ensuing and so forth. So in that case, there is positive evidence that we can adduce for the ongoing necessity of the propagation of the Greek inheritance. But now let's go to the second proposition. Go back to the Battle of Marathon and suppose it had gone the other way. If the Persians had defeated the Greeks at Marathon, then dot dot dot. Well, what would have happened? And what would count as evidence here? Because we can imagine, counterfactually, lots of things that, that could have happened if the, Greeks, if the Greeks had lost and the Persians had won. We can imagine victorious Persians stamping out Greek culture. Or we can imagine dispirited Greeks, oh, we lost, and letting themselves slide into insignificance. Both of those have happened lots of times in historical circumstances that we know of. But we can also imagine a more relaxed, conquering Persian regime. Yeah, we defeated the Greeks, but we're content with tribute, and we're not going to stamp you out. Right? We can also imagine tenacious Greeks keeping the flame alive. We lost, but they want revenge, they want to get their act together, and they rebel successfully a few years later. So if the Persians had won at Marathon and defeated the Greeks, which of those four imagined possibilities would have happened? Imagination aside, we can think analogically to uh, his real historical cases. We do know from the 300s to the 500 CE, the victory of early Christianity toward the tail end of the Roman Empire, that did lead to the suppression and near extermination of Greek culture. But previously, a couple of centuries, from uh, 197 to 30 before Christ, the Romans systematically defeated the Greeks. Yet the Greek inheritance survived, becoming not only part of Roman culture, but for many generations the dominant philosophy of the Romans. I really like here the saying that the Romans defeated the Greeks, but the Greeks conquered the Romans. So a Persian victory would have led to which result? I don't know. And not knowing that, can we say, as strongly as John Stuart Mill said, how important that Mill was to where we are 2,500 years later? Now, to come back to coffee, coffee arrived on the scene in Western Europe only 500 years ago. That's only like 20% of the time. But we still have the same hard what-if questions for the coffee-caused Enlightenment thesis. If coffee had not arrived in Europe in 1529, well, where would Europe be now? But to uh, draw things to a close on a lighter note, uh, bringing things up to contemporary times, 
First, a warning. If the zombie apocalypse should arrive or some other terrible event, do not go to Switzerland if you are a coffee lover, as the government of Switzerland has decided that coffee is not vital for human survival, and so has ended its long-standing practice of stockpiling coffee beans in case of national emergencies. Switzerland thus enters the debate on the coffee not essential side. But just imagine the end of civilization and no coffee, a double insult. Second, it's also charming to reflect on early strong opposition to coffee in the 1600s, as uh, not everyone in the West welcomed coffee's arrival or saw it as a boon to civilization. So in the interest of fairness, we should at least hear out the dissenting side. The most dis vigorous dissenters, it turns out, were women. I quote from a 1674 document, the Women's Petition Against Coffee. Quote, Coffee leads men to trifle away their time, scald their chops, and spend their money all for a little base, black, thick, nasty, bitter, stinking, nauseous puddle water. Unquote. And even worse, a little later in the document, the excessive use of that newfangled, abominable, heathenish liquor called coffee, which riffling nature of her choicest treasures, and drying up the radical moisture, has so eunuch our husbands, and crippled our more kind gallants, that they are become as impotent as age, and as unfruitful as those deserts where that unhappy berry is said to be brought. Yikes, especially that part about impotence and drying up the radical moisture. Reminds me that during the days of alcohol prohibition, some women activists for the cause had a slogan meant to encourage their men to say sober, quote, lips that touch liquor shall never touch mine, unquote. Adapting that to the anti-caffeine cause, quote, Lips that touch coffee shall never touch mine. Heaven forbid. To that I retort with update-to-date reports that heart health is not affected by even 25 cups of coffee a day. Now, of course, the ladies might respond and their allies. Too much coffee and caffeine can trigger anxiety and other negatives. The scientific debate continues. So, dear ladies, let's plan to discuss these very serious matters further. At the cafe, of course. I'll buy.